right, uh, we're going to move on to another question here. Uh, Chris, how did you fine tune the frequency response of the FR30 or Aspen series speaker to ensure a balanced and accurate representation of audio across various genres and recording types? Yeah, that's uh, that's a, good, a great question and something that is a challenge because there's this circle of confusion in recording because everyone's recording setup is a little different from home setups and not everything is consistent. And it's changed the greatly since the advent of home recording compared uh, to what uh, people were doing in professional studios for many years. Very much. And, um, and so it's, there's been actually people have spent a career researching what is the ideal response of, of a speaker and, um, and how do you make something that sounds neutral across the most number of recordings. The way that some of the science was done on it was that they looked at, user preferences, like listening preferences, when have people do blind listening to different speakers and rate them. And they'd use a selection of music that represented a bunch of genres, right. a bunch of different recordings. Classical to rock. And, oh yeah, yeah, all, yeah, all of it. And what they found that was pretty consistent across, because there used to be a thought, you know, people on the West Coast like one sound, or people that are in another country like another sound, and people that are in different areas, that, that, that it wasn't a universal right. thing, uh, and that you should have different sounds for different music. And it turns out, all that isn't really true, actually. People <laughs> universally like kind of the same things. Yeah. Uh, there is some um, differences between how much you listen. So part of it is your, your hearing actually adjusts to the speakers you have, too. You sort of, what you listen to equipment-wise starts to sound more and more correct to your brain. Sure. Um, you become we, accustomed to we're, it. We're, we're, we adapt as, yeah. as humans. You know, there's that experiment where... If someone wears glasses that invert their vision long enough, your brain will eventually flip it back over. Sure. Which is really strange. Well, actually, our vision is inverted. Uh, as it goes through the lens, it inverts, but your brain right. you know, has learned to correct that. So you, you can accommodate big changes over time even and have them sound pretty correct. But with a speaker, what the science ended up saying uh, well, is that you want a speaker that is generally flat and yeah. then smooth on axis. And then as you go off axis, you want it to be smooth as well. You don't want to have particular frequencies bump, bump up. Yeah, and yeah. it can be different directivities, but standard speakers, these become more directional slowly at high frequency. And you want that to be done in a smooth way so that the total sound power uh, in the room, so all the sound that the speaker is making throughout the whole room, smooth gradually changes, doesn't have a, you know something pop up. Sure. Where it's, much, much wider coverage at a particular frequency range than another. So we try to, when we're designing a speaker, we try to make it flat, but then the voicing uh, has to do with getting a, the tonal balance in the room correct with the uh, off axis and sound power. Um, and then with speakers, you know, ideally you'd have, as the frequencies get smaller, the drive units would get smaller. So you'd have, you know, a woofer to a mid-range to a tweeter, gradually, gradually change. But you have discrete jumps between them in a speaker. You're not going to have a six-way speaker or something like that. Sure. So this is a three-way speaker. We're doing some two-way speakers. And as you get to smaller and, and, and smaller numbers of steps between them, the directivity jumps can happen more. So you can have some flares off axis and stuff. So you use some directivity control. We're doing some little shallow acoustic wave guides to try to make it smooth off axis. But sure. it all lives in the crossover. Yeah. Uh, and also the physical alignment of all the drive units and stuff. So you want mids and tweeters as close together as you can get. Um, yeah, time, timing. Well, yeah. yeah, because you, you know, as you move vertically or something, there's a time delay between the drive units that changes and that causes a notch in the response off axis. So sure. we put that vertically because you know our ears are on the sides of our head we're a lot more sensitive to horizontal changes than we are vertical um, sound so the drive units are spaced vertically on most on most speakers and then we um, try to push the crossover points low enough so that the drive units are within a quarter wavelength of each other at the crossover frequency right and then we use pretty steep acoustic slopes so we use a fourth order acoustic slope so there's minimal overlap between the drive units which gives better directivity mm -hmm. uh, so you don't have those peaks and dips off axis as much because yeah. the region that they're overlapping is smaller so that when you do have a, a change in delay between them by physically standing up or down or moving that it's gives you a broader sweet spot um, again you still hi-fi in stereo really only exists in a pretty small space with two channels you have to you know a lot of the imaging and, and sort of magic of stereo, the, the phantom center image and, and stuff, is really when the left and right speakers are perfectly matched. Right. So 
you know, that's a, another thing is getting really close tolerances between the speakers sure. um, uh, in their frequency responses and balance and stuff. And then, you know, we're looking at dynamic range of the system too. So you don't want to push a tweeter too low and have the system not have the kind of output capability that you need before it starts to sound strained. And so there's there's limitations to all this stuff and it's yeah. it's some of the art and science of it is how you blend all that stuff together. Uh, it happens um, in the crossover and, and, and there's no magic bullet with any of that. It's just sound, general engineering, speaker engineering principles. Right. But we um, try to leverage all the research that's been done out there as far as as it relates to sound quality, um, you know, and a lot of the uh, sound quality of a speaker, something like 30% of it is the bass, how the bass balances versus everything else. Sure. So that was a big part of the speakers. We really overbuilt the woofer section so that we can have great bass extension and balanced bass. Control, relative. pitch definition, yeah, things all, like all that. that. Yeah. Um, and so that was a lot of the speaker's presentation and representation of sound was, was focused there. Um, but it's... Um, you know, with different recordings, you'll find that the spectral po power balance changes. So if you're listening to... Dramatically, from pop to classical right, to... Right, yeah. Right. And so, um, you know, some things are really demanding. Uh, and some things are, if you're listening to girl on guitar at moderate levels, you can have a pretty small speaker that sounds great. But when you're looking at full-scale classical stuff, or you have some kind of EDM at your bleeding levels, you need something that's really high dynamic range Absolutely. and bass capability. So that's really where the different genre thing comes in that you mentioned about is yeah. uh, this, what, what, what's the distortion characteristic of the speaker and how, how does it overload? And that's not necessarily in the frequency response. That's more in, in the dynamic range of the system yeah. or, you know, non, nonlinear kind of response of the speakers because speakers aren't per perfectly linear. They're, they, sure. they're fairly distorted as compared to a lot of components in your system. Right. So, um, but yeah, with tr you try to, Tonal balance is still the number one sound quality thing. Yeah. And you, you try to um, make it as accurate as possible. The other thing that's interesting, when I was, you, you read uh, some of the, the science on tonal balance and speakers, they, they would do trained listeners versus untrained listeners. So the longer you've been listening, sort of the flatter you want it. Yeah. But guys that are new listeners tend to like more bass. Sure. Uh, and they also tend to like a little more treble. So, um, and it's as much as like 6 dB difference in the bass, which is a lot. Yeah. Um, and so there is no wrong, uh, even if you like it, it's good. It's subjective. We it's, all, it, there, yeah. There's some subjectivity, but you know, you want something that works across a wide, as a manufacturer, you know, I want to make a lot of different people happy with the sound of. of Absolutely. And the FR thirties and the Aspen series do shine, I think in, in, uh, that uh, that aspect, I think, listening to classical on them and listening to some hard rock. Uh, I had a, a customer come in uh, a couple weeks weeks ago for a tour, and uh, it was quite interesting as they wanted to hear Slayer. Oh, that's amazing! Uh, you know, and that's uh, it's cool to hear a different perspective or a different style of music, and mm -hmm. and and hear what the the Aspen series does with those compared to a Bach piece. So really fun. Yeah, that is fun, and, and it's challenging, and uh, I, I think. You know, that's part of the fun of all of this. It is. Yeah.